let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worship and for the privilege of being able to gather together right now and to hear your word on this Easter morning. We pray that you would fill our hearts with hope and strengthen us with your grace and power as we open your word again and ask you to speak to us afresh right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, over the course of this series, I've introduced you to a number of eagle videos. And in one of them, an eagle is released from Dubai's Burj Khalifa, which is the tallest building in the world. And in real time, we're actually watching the trainer give commands to the eagle to spread its wings and glide until finally he puts his arms together, signaling to the eagle to dive. But what I began to realize as I was watching this for the first time was that the eagle could see his trainer for the entire flight from more than 2,000 feet above before he came down from the sky to rejoin his trainer. Now, what John reminds us is that like that eagle, our Lord descended to where we live. They were able to see him with their own eyes, touch him with their own hands, and know him personally. He chose to live among us and to share life with us. When Jesus was not alone in prayer, he was teaching and serving and helping people. His mother at a wedding banquet, a curious Pharisee who comes to him by night, a woman of Samaria, a man waiting to be healed for 36 years. Jesus behaved like the closest of friends. And on this Easter Sunday, we've arrived at this pivotal point of John's Gospel where Jesus makes a decision that will bring life to Lazarus, one of his closest friends, but actually endanger his own life. As Jesus goes to Bethany to see three of his closest friends, let's notice that in a series of personal meetings, how he takes the time to listen to the doubts and the fears of his friends and then shows us the greatest reason for hope the world has ever known. We can look at this passage in John chapter 11 like a series of meetings. And in that first meeting, Jesus spends time with his disciples where he makes it clear that he is a friend of the fearful. Let's begin reading in chapter 11 with verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, but rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the authorities were just now trying to stone you. Are, are you going there again? Jesus answered, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I I'm glad I was not there so that you might believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now I want you to picture that moment when Jesus learns that Lazarus is ill. He knows that if he returns to Judea again to see Mary and Martha, and to go to the tomb of Lazarus, that he will set in motion the events that lead to his death. The disciples are not real thrilled about what Jesus intends to do, which is not surprising because the last time he was there, he almost got himself killed. Rabbi, the temple authorities were just trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus doesn't waver. Instead, he says, I am going there. I am going there despite the risk of inflaming more opposition to me. I'm going there knowing I will soon be arrested and put to death. I'm going there to show the power of God's love. Now, for his part, Thomas says, 
let's go with him that we might die with him. Did you catch that? Is he being courageous or has he just resigned to his fate? It seems like it's a little bit of both. And we can relate to Thomas, not wanting to go, but feeling like you, we have to go. Now, where have you had to go lately that you really didn't want to go? And where must you go right now that you would like to avoid going? A medical appointment, another online classroom, a stressful work meeting, an uncomfortable family gathering. Over the past 12 months, there are many, many places we did not want to go. But wherever you may be this morning, Jesus says, I am going there with you because there's no place that you must go that I will not go as your Lord, even to death itself. Now, Jesus' second meeting takes place with Martha, where he offers hope for the skeptical and the discouraged. Let's continue with verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jewish people had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Hmm. When Martha goes out to meet Jesus, her first words reveal her honest feelings, her despair. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have died. Martha, Martha fears it's too late, even for Jesus, and she reminds him that Lazarus has been dead four days. Obviously, dead is dead, but to be dead for four days was, well, it was even deader because it was believed that the soul separated from the body on the fourth day. So Martha's point is that this problem was bigger than even Jesus can handle. Nevertheless, Jesus tells her, your brother will rise again. And from Martha's response, we know that she thought Jesus was trying to console her with a theological platitude because of the way she responds. I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And those words conveyed that Martha understood all the dogma of her faith. She believed in the resurrection at the end of time, but she did not yet understand who Jesus really was. And so Jesus makes it clear, wait a minute, I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Wow, Martha's feelings are completely understandable. But Jesus doesn't see life the way we do. The grave of Lazarus points to the cross and the empty tomb where we learn that no prayer spoken, no suffering or pain endured, and no act of love is ever in vain. But now we need to follow Jesus to his third meeting with Mary, where he sheds tears with the tearful. Let's read on in verse 28. When Martha had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the people who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the people said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? It's important for us to recognize 
that Jesus responded to the doubt and despair of Mary and Martha, not simply with words. He responded with his heart. When Mary comes to him weeping for her brother, the RSV and the NIV Bible says that he was deeply moved or greatly disturbed. And then we read in verse 35 that Jesus began to weep, or literally, Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible, the shortest verse. But why did Jesus weep? After all, he knew what he was about to do. He knew how the story would end. Yet as he looks around him at Mary and Martha and the crowds who grieved at the grave of of the one he loved, he joins that procession of sorrow for his friend. And, And it reminds us that part of what it means to be human is to love so well that we feel the absence, the heartache of the one we love with a terrible, terrible pain. Jesus weeps with us in our grief, and he weeps because for many, grief comes without hope. As Jesus looks at us in our grief with compassion in his eyes, it is our certainty that death is the final reality that breaks his heart. As Paul once said, Jesus' friends grieved as others do who have no hope. Despite the promises of Scripture, despite the signs that Jesus had performed among them which pointed to his divine mastery over every phase of life, despite the word he proclaimed and his promise of eternal life, they mourned as others do who have no hope. Nevertheless, he did not come to condemn them for their lack of faith. He came to grieve with them. He came to carry their sorrows. He understood their pain. When we are hurting, we don't need friends to preach at us or give us advice. We need friends to quietly sit with us, to share their time with us, and maybe even cry with us. And the one who sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane knew what it was to grieve with friends. But let's go on to the fourth and final meeting when Jesus meets with Lazarus, or his prayers move the immovable. Let's read verse 38 and following. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they might believe that you sent me. Then, when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, and his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Jesus moves the immovable. The Son of Man, the Son of God, is the first mover here. He is moved by love. Moved by love. And he moves those around him with God's power. He prays not only for Lazarus, but he prays for the gathered crowd and for us. He prays aloud so that the crowd around him can see what is always the case. Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they might believe that you sent me. Jesus wanted those who were listening to be filled with faith and confidence in God's power and love. Then Jesus approaches the tomb where there is an already rotting corpse inside, and there he cries out with a loud voice, and we can only imagine it, Lazarus, come out. Notice first that Jesus calls him by name, because Jesus, as we learned last week, is the good shepherd. He calls our names because he knows our names, and he loves us, each one. And yet this is not just a big meeting between Jesus and Lazarus, but between Jesus and death. As Dale Bruner puts it, 
An immovable object meets an irresistible force. Death meets Christ, and Christ conquers. Death is powerful, but it is not all-powerful. What Jesus reveals is God's life-giving power. And on Easter morning, when Jesus rises from death, never to die again, he reveals that death is permanently defeated in his name. So Jesus cries with this loud voice, The shadow of death has met its match, and Lazarus comes forth. And then Jesus says, Unbind him and let him go. I love that. Unbind him, Jesus says to the crowd. I love that Jesus doesn't do all the work. He leaves some stuff for us to do. Certainly Jesus could have unbound Lazarus himself, but instead he sets us on our feet to join him in his work. He unbinds us from fear and self-doubt and sets us free to go in his name. We begin by simply practicing God's presence and calling him to mind in our daily activities. Maybe we begin by simply praying or humming a song that reminds us of God. Or we talk or we write about God. We seek to relieve suffering in a prayerful spirit. Maybe we go to work calling to mind God's presence. We whisper to God. We, we look at a picture or a symbol of Jesus. We, we read a scripture verse or a poem about God. We breathe a simple prayer for the people that we meet on the street. We give the gift of listening without trying to fix the problem. We help someone in a practical way for Jesus' sake. And we remind them that God loves them. We stand for one who cannot stand for themselves. Frank Laubach once said that when we do simple things like these throughout the day, the titanic forces of the universe bend like gravity to pull things and people in our direction because we are going in God's direction. Friends, I began by saying that our Lord, like an eagle, could fly high above us. We know that, but chose instead to be seen and known here with us on the ground. The story of Lazarus shows us the immense loving care of Christ for his suffering friends, who knows better than we do that suffering is not the last word. I remember praying with my home church for a five-year-old boy with a serious illness that caused him to lapse into a coma. He was the son of our church organist and the congregation had prayed for him for months and he seemed only to grow sicker. We were slowly resigning to what was. It was so hard to understand God's purpose in all of this. Doubt and despair seemed to be taking its toll. And then I got a phone call one morning saying that the boy was pronounced brain dead by the doctors. And that morning, I sadly opened my devotional Bible where the reading for the day was John chapter 11, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in me, if, even if they die, yet shall they live. I took so much solace in the words of Jesus that day, so beautifully timed, even as I grieved the death of this little boy. But you know, the next day, my phone rang. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The child who was totally unresponsive the day before had revived and his brain activity had returned to normal. He was alive, really alive. And today he's a healthy young man. I remember going back to that scripture, speechless with gratitude. And yet, if I'm honest, I had some other thoughts too. I thought of those who haven't been healed, those whose conditions haven't improved after prayer. Today, I think of those who have lost loved ones during COVID-19 or jobs, or who've experienced violence or emotional and even religious abuse. Life doesn't always work out the way we would choose or plan, but that's when the Lord reminded me this, that he chose love instead of hate, that he chose forgiveness instead of revenge, that he chose to bear our sins on the cross, that we might walk with him from an empty tomb. Let's declare his words again on this Easter morning, that solemn promise of our Savior, I am the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in me, even if they die, yet shall they live. Let's ponder that in this moment of silent prayer.